Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our last lecture of the semester. Um, and it's a great last lecture to have. It's really my pleasure to welcome Tom Gunning to Milwaukee. Uh, he's been here before. He's just uh, down the road at the University of Chicago. Um, Tom is, uh, <coughs> it's, I've been thinking about what I would say. Uh, Tom is just kind of, I think, uh, an amazing uh, scholar and uh, a fantastic person. He's. Uh, published two books and probably about a hundred articles, reviews, and chapters. And I think that um, he works in small form or short form, I think, uh, in an extraordinarily uh, deep and complex way. Um, one article of his on the uh, aesthetic of astonishment and cinema of attractions, <coughs> excuse me, which was a, um, and is the best sort of <coughs> interpretation of the legendary scene at the birth of cinema when the Lumiere film of the train arriving at the station supposedly caused uh, audience to run in fear, thinking that the train was going to run them over. And <coughs> I should have a Diet Coke myself. Um, and Tom uh, reinterprets that, I think, super, really powerfully to explain that Come on, people weren't silly enough to really think it was a train, but there was a contradiction between <clears throat> what they knew that they were sitting in a film theater and what their bodily affect was, what they felt when they saw this image coming at them, and that that produced what he calls an aesthetic of astonishment. And that concept is actually, uh, well, certainly the most important concept to my mind in uh, work on early cinema. Um, a couple other things, random things I will say about Tom Gunning. Um, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to be invited to give a talk at the Domator Conference, a uh, plenary talk in the 2002, and at the end of the conference, um, they invited the plenary speakers to come and do a panel afterwards. Um, a wrap-up panel, and I really am not a, I'm not a film scholar or an early cinema scholar, but it was a fascinating conference. But one of the things I noticed is that almost every paper I listened to uh, cited Tom Gunning's work. <coughs> so I approached my little, my short comment afterwards as an anthropologist and suggested that one thing I learned is that there was this sacred figure in the early cinema uh, world uh, that people were forced to, uh, or compelled to ritualistically uh, cite, uh, the figure of Tom Gunning. Um, the last thing I'll say uh, about Tom that I think really for me captures um, who he is or his strengths is I think Tom is first and foremost a teacher and a professor and, and what any great professor makes you want to do is study what it is that they teach and what they know about. And every time I hear Tom's work or every time I read one of his essays, I think I should be working on that. I should be studying that. And I really, I can't think of a, a greater compliment that I could pay to a teacher than to make a, a student want to uh, work on the, on the area that they're experts in. And I think, I hope you all have that experience today. So without any further ado, welcome Tom. Well, I'm delighted to be here and uh, thank uh, Richard for inviting me. Uh, we had to go through a series of different schedules. No, that week's not good. No, that week's not. So finally, we <coughs> ran down to this one, and I'm very happy to be here. And as I recall, because I remember that I think I kind of blushed, what you actually said at the Domator was a tutelary god <laughs> known as Tom Gunning. And so, uh, so that's. <laughs> One of the, I hope they put that on my tombstone. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay, so 
This is a kind of odd talk. Uh, it's not really about digital cinema exactly, although it is to some extent. It's more about kind of language and about the term, and that's partly why uh, you know the kind of long title is something that I wanted people to uh, to be aware of because it's really about the idea of the hand. <clears throat> so I will just launch into this. This afternoon, I want to examine the reach of the digital into our field of media, attempting to deviate from its dominant association with the abstract and the mathematical, and direct it back to its origins in the bodily, and to grope towards the significance this might hold for us. The term digital is now used to define not only fields of inquiry, I see an increased number of academic ads for positions in digital media, uh, and methods of production, but even our theoretical understanding of visual and auditory media. This relatively new phrase has become common. We see it everywhere. But does this familiarity actually prevent us from thinking through its implications? I intend to defamiliarize the term in this discussion and to explore issues that I feel not only belong to new media, but help us grasp the nature of technology generally. How does technology relate to the human senses? That is, to what we understand as our bodily experience. To grasp our bodily experience of technology, I want to revive the dead metaphor, the term digital holds. How does it happen that this term, this name for a new medium that many claim to be the triumph of abstraction and of the disembodied also gives us the finger, <laughs> the digit. <clears throat> Does technology possess a sense of texture? The central connotations of this term, texture, refer, I think, equally to the qualities of human touch and to the materiality of the object being touched. Can we extend this to the digital? Does the digital have a texture, a sense of touch. In media context, digital seems an antipodes from the tactile. The digital, made entirely of zeros and ones, as we so often hear, cannot be touched. Yet I am insisting on the residual physical reference carried by this term to the human hand and its digits. This is merely a linguistic coincidence, the product of a contiguous history, and perhaps. But the irony and the paradox of language and its histories always intrigue me. So let us consider the digital as the epitome of abstraction. The claim has often been made, and I in fact have spent a number of essays trying to dispute it, that the digital, especially digital photography and perhaps digital sound recording, cuts us off from a reference to the world in contrast to the more physical causal nexus that chemical photography has to its reference. The numerical nature of the digit, it is claimed, severs photography's indexical link. Ah, uh, yes, the index. <laughs> the supposed persistence of the natural within the semiotics. But I can't resist, and I hope you'll join me, in hearing another linguistic contamination here as well. The index also refers to a finger, and even more, to a gesture, the forefinger or the pointing finger. So can the digital really abolish the indexical? We seem to be involved in a sort of finger fight here. <laughs> Why does the prehensile human hand, with its phalanges, take such a compelling grasp on the theoretical language of media? I think this involves more than just a play of language. These metaphors work for us because they remind us of something we're apt to forget, our embodied relation to the process of communication. Tracing this metaphor puts into question the tendency to oppose media and the human body, contrasting the fleshly materiality of the physical and the abstraction of the medium of communication from language on. 
The hand, as much as the voice, shapes human communication. Language and media are rooted in the body. The technologies of communication, new and old, do not necessarily leave the body behind, but rather allow us to reach out to the world and to others. Media starts from the body and extends it. I want this afternoon to offer a preliminary sketch of the ways the medium of cinema extends the prehensile human hand and its complexities of touch, grasp, and gesture. Now, language bound, the association I'm making to the digital might seem to be limited to English. In French, which has often supplied the language of film theory, digital is actually translated as numérique, as I realized when one of my essays on the index in photography was published in French. However, the connection between these two seemingly distant terms, number and digit, meaning finger, evokes the bodily nexus of the process of abstraction. It returns us to one of childhood's first lessons, counting on or with our fingers, which of course is the basis of the decimal system held firmly in our two hands. This physical fact may supply the crux of the ambiguity of disembodiment in the linguistic roots of the digital. How does the digital relate to our hand, and specifically to its dimensions of touch, grasp, and gesture? Now, my second section, which I call hands up. Let me restate the problem. In adjusting to the digital revolution, many claim we are losing our sense of the body. <coughs> does the digital take the act of communication profoundly out of our hands? When Advent digital editing machines were being introduced in the 70s, I was teaching within a film production program that confronted the radical revision, this radical revision of the craft of editing. I asked my colleague at the time, Miriam Arsham, a veteran editor who had begun her involvement in film production by working with Maya Darren. If you've seen that very fine documentary in the mirror of Maya Darren, Mimi is one of the prime interlocutors. She had, uh, and she taught our courses in film editing, what she thought of the new process. Having just mastered it, she commented, well, it makes lots of things a lot easier, but gosh, it feels to me like, look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> editing, she explained, had always been for her a manual process, founded in the logic of touch and gesture, based in the feel of the film strip in her hands as much as the realization of ideas and vision. With the advent of computerized editing, the process seemed to be taken out of her hands and rendered abstractly conceptual, disembodied. The advent of new media makes us aware not only of specific changes, but of the nature of media generally. Art history consists fundamentally of tracing transformations in method and media and the ways they affect images and our experience of them. The digital turn raises critical issues. But it is a historian's task to trace not only ruptures, but continuities. To see and change not the end of history, but its ongoing patterns. This demands confrontation with the novel and differences that new processes introduce. But the spell of novelty can induce amnesia. The concern that Miriam Arsham expressed to me that the digital might abolish a tradition of manual craft in editing should not lead us to automatically assume that the digital spells the death of the hand's sense of tact and touch in cinema. Rather, for historians, this turn should open up a broader consideration of technology's relation to the hand as an extension of the hand, as much as its erasure. Hasn't the machine always seemed to replace the hand? Doesn't the difference between the tool and the machine lie in the way the machine overtakes the hand, transforming especially the sense of handicraft that the tool retains. I would claim that cinema as a machine art 
has always involved a complicated relation to the hand. We could think of cinema and photography as replacing the drawing hand in the production of images, a transformation that, of course, long predates the digital and which the digital extends rather than inaugurates. I propose we use the digital turn as a way to contemplate cinema as an extension and transformation of our sense of the hand's way of touching, grasping, and gesturing towards the world. If cinema's relation to the hand has become attenuated in an era in which we manage electronic impulses rather than tangible materials like the film strip and splicing tape, we need to theorize the relation of cinema to the hand broadly. The appearance of new media opens both opportunities and dangers for theory. The opportunities are obvious. Theory responds to new objects and processes, describing their possibilities and practices. Whenever the playing, um, I'm sorry, <coughs> whenever the playing pieces change, the rules of the game need to be re-examined, and such is the role of theory. The danger, though, is more insidious. There is a temptation to valorize or demonize a new medium or method by simply opposing it starkly to previous media without exploring continuities. Thereby, we risk transforming innovation into an absolute dichotomy. Thus, to explore cinema's relation to the hand, we should not simply demonize the digital as a restrictive hands-off. We need to explore how cinema throughout its history has related to the hand, both technically and phenomenologically. I will not attempt to tackle this huge issue this afternoon. <coughs> you will be able to go home. But I do want to offer, first, some methodological considerations, and then to sketch three basic issues that I feel open up this issue. <coughs> Tactile cinema, or the role of virtual touch in cinema, the virtual grasp of cinema, and finally, gestural cinema, or the hand as signification in motion. <coughs> Next section is a brief methodological interlude, which phenomenology of experience and technical analysis. Let me begin with tactile cinema, the area that has been most developed theoretically in recent years. The theorization of the cinematic spectator especially as sketched in 1970s apparatus theory, we now recognize, limited our view of cinema, well, limited, to it, limited it to a view. However, the theorization of cinema as a visual medium hardly celebrated vision. It formed part of what Martin Jay called the denigration of vision, which decried vision for its sense of mastery and fixation an instrumental visuality embodied in the grid of perspective. <clears throat> a new approach to the film spectator not only needed to place vision within a confluence of the other senses, but had to rethink the nature of vision in cinema, questioning its subjection to regularity and rationalized logic. Jay pointed out an alternative approach to vision and the senses in the phenomenology of perception offered by the work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Thus, in uncovering the role of touch or sound in cinema, we must not simply rearrange the hierarchy among the senses, but question the role of hierarchy itself. The senses do not act as separate channels of information under the tyranny of sight, but rather, in this view, work together to open human perception to a world. Now, film is a visual medium. It addresses the eye. However, a number of recent film theorists, all with a relation to phenomenological methods, have extended our sense of what gets addressed through cinematic vision and how. Whereas the apparatus theorists of the 70s denigrated the act of vision 
as involving a disembodied gaze, seeing the eye as an organ of mastery and rational analysis. Recent work by Vivian Sobchak, Jennifer Barker, and Laura Marks have all argued for a tactile dimension of our experience of cinema, even if it's carried through visual phenomena. The phenomenological approach fundamentally questions the atomization of perception into measurable and distinguishable units of sensation, holding instead that, as Merleau-Ponty puts it, our perception opens onto a complex world before it becomes analyzed into separate sensations. I'm very much in sympathy with this work and consider my own approach as based in phenomenology. Methodologically, I argue that any historical analysis of technology must consider the experience of the medium as much as its technological processes and ideological forms. I believe that the central problem in the analysis of new media lies in not distinguishing between a phenomenological method and a technical analysis. In other words, between describing the effects of the technological apparatus, which includes the human recipient for whom and by whom it was designed. And on the other hand, a technical analysis of the device itself, that is, how it operates. Phenomenology explores the world-building nature of perception. Technical analysis deconstructs technology into its means, its component parts, structure, and operation. The sort of technological history I'm proposing here needs to look at both aspects, the phenomenological and the technical, but in relation to each other and not mistaking one for the other. All too often discussions of the digital make this mistake. The analysis of perceptual signals into discrete bits defines digital media technically. The direct relevance of this technical analysis to our perceptual experience should not be simply assumed. Okay, let me get specific. We only see pixels under certain circumstances, such as enlargement. Of course, they're always there. And this is a crucial technical fact. But the aesthetic effects of the digital cannot be simply read off the process by which the image is made. Certain viewers, and even more certain auditors, have described aesthetic effects based in the experience of the digital, such as a hyperclarity of sound or image, which seems to them rather artificial. Now, I find such preliminary observations valuable to a phenomenological analysis, since they're rooted in their experience. But a logical argument, such as many theorists have made, claiming that because pixels are based in digital computing, they are necessarily deficient in giving us a sense of experience, seems to me a deduction and not a phenomenological observation. Further, the digital and the cinematic are always changing. Rather than seizing upon a specific point in their evolution and identifying it as essential, we should recognize the protean nature of cinema as its paradoxical essence. Cinema has a infinite or almost infinite capacity for transformation, which in fact the digital increases exponentially. I remember some decades ago viewing films that combined traditional film stock and video images, such as the Blair Witch Project. And at that point, I tangibly experienced the contrast between the surface and tactile qualities of the two media, a difference highlighted when the film cut directly from one to the other. However, this contrast hardly operates in the current realm of high definition video or 2K or 4K DCP projection in which pixels disappear. The digital therefore has many forms and textures as did film stocks. Think for instance of the way that Super 8 film has been used in recent films as a radically different mode of representation. 
Thus, we return to the interactions of elements of style and must abandon the illusion that we can describe the medium technically and therefore describe our experience of it. So, moving into my three sections, I start with touch. The experience of the tactile in cinema must be carried by the other senses, visual and even auditory. Although technically speaking, the cinema offers us only oral and visual signifiers. This does not exclude tactile experience, as Jennifer Barker has demonstrated through her detailed description of film sequences in her book, The Tactile Eye. Human senses converge interdependently. This forbids viewing the senses as abstract carriers of information to be stored and calculated as if on a computer. But it doesn't imply some unusual experience of synesthesia in which colors carry sounds or touch evokes taste. The convergence of the senses simply characterizes our common everyday experience. The senses deliver experience not through a process of addition, but as a complex unity that we're challenged to break into separate parts. Think of the most sensual of the arts cuisine, where color, texture, taste, smell, and even sound converge in the experience of eating. Recall, for instance, biting into a red apple. The phenomenological self is embodied, which means its sense of the world and itself are implicated, interwoven in what Merleau-Ponty calls the flesh of the world, an imminent sensual commonality. Thus the senses do not function as semiotic signs of the world that need to be translated. Rather, our senses reveal our presence in and of the world rather than registering an analytical distance from it that must be logically decoded. Our sense of cinema must derive from a complex understanding of our perception of the world which is not a matter of abstracted subjective apprehension or representation, but of a bodily, sensual involvement. Nonetheless, I think it's a mistake to simply identify cinema with ordinary perception, how, however much it's dependent upon it. The film spectator must be understood as embodied, certainly. However, it would be misleading to identify the human body with the body of the film. While we must not mistake the technical processes of a medium for our experience of it, we also must not assume that the cinematic medium simply mirrors our embodied experience. I'm calling here for an understanding not only of our imbrication with the world, but of the role of technological media as a mediation that bridges, minds, and plays with our perception. Cinema and video technology do not simply replicate perception. Rather, they transform and play with human perception, and therefore, thereby provide a means by which we can experience our experience. Cinema, like other art forms, allows us to touch the process of touching to see the process of seeing. Media theory must explore our experience of media, which refers to, but does not simply replicate, our perceptual experience. We must not ignore the work that the medium performs in transforming experience. Art plays with the senses, and technology facilitates this, just as it can also control or regulate perception. Thus, as Jonathan Crary has pointed out, the new technological environment of the 19th and 20th century saw the appearance of devices which did separate sensual experience into different channels. The cinema could do for the eye what the phonograph did for the ear, as Thomas Edison put it. These devices appeared in a technological environment that sought to analyze the senses by breaking them into discrete units. 
This process of abstract analysis allowed fine-grained description as well as precise mastery of the human sensorium. Analytical perceptual psychology played a key role in the reorganization of industrial work processes and the design of new apparatuses. The ideology of observation and control characteristic of modern technology under disciplinary societies operates in this manner. As Crary details, instrumental reason and its tools in the modern era takes the human sensorium as its object, breaking it down into component parts, the better to control its efficiency. I would claim that the technical understanding of human perception as machine-like, subject to total manipulation, belongs somewhat unwittingly and maybe even unwillingly to this tradition. For instance, by suspending literal motion, <coughs> but tracing its trajectory graphically, chronophotography, such as the work of Etienne Jules Marais, which we see here, was able to chart the course of muscles and limbs, or the dynamics of fluids and air currents. I'm not questioning the usefulness or accuracy of this process of separation and analysis, on which key scientific processes of generating data rest. Indeed, it is its utility as analysis that I want to stress but it remains at antipodes to the phenomenological method that I've been describing, which emerged partly as a reaction against this classical form of analysis. And as a tool for understanding perceptual or aesthetic experience, I would claim this analytical tradition is limited and can even become a source of distortion. The challenge lies in being able both to acknowledge the way technology allows us to break down human perception and the dangers of control and discipline this enables, but at the same time, not to limit our view of technological transformation to this coercive role. If technology may be designed to work, it can also be made to play. If it can discipline the subject, it can also liberate her senses by making her aware of them in new ways. I would claim that this is one mission of cinema aesthetics and media theory, from Jean Epstein to Walter Benjamin to Gilbert Simondon. Cinema's technological roots must be interrelated with an address to the embodied senses, with the aim of developing rather than blunting the senses. Methodologically, therefore, I'm calling for an acknowledgement of both the phenomenology of perception and experience and an awareness of the way technology interacts with this embodied experience and even extends and transforms it. Thus building on Jennifer Barker and Laura Marx's understanding of how cinema and video richly evoke the tactile through images and sound, I want to explore the paradoxical nature of this experience by acknowledging both its phenomenological and its technological nature. An emblematic moment of the tactile eye appears, I would claim, in the opening of Dali and Bunuel's Unshan Andalou from 1929. This iconic image of a sliced eyebrow not only allegorically slices the realm of the disembodied eye and its mastery of space and visuality, but it also delivers the viewer over to an experience of touch as violation, a reduction of the eye to its material gunk, the slicing of a surface into a wound. Few moments of cinema so dramatically convey the sensual address of the medium. We certainly don't just see the act of splitting an eyeball. We feel it, even if tactile contact, contact does not occur. But crucially, we also don't feel it. We're aware that we've not been blinded. Although disturbing, the experience also demonstrates our distance from what we've seen. 
the protection that the screen and the cinematic apparatus offers us. Now, Dali also proposed a more problematic technical foray into the realm of cinematic touch. In 1931, after completing his cinematic collaboration with Louis Bunuel on Un Chien Andalou and Lodge Door, Dali wrote to Bunuel about another cinematic project which remains unrealized. Now, quoting from Dali. I think a lot about a tactile cinema. It would be simple and really fantastic if we could do something like that in our film or a plain illustration. The spectators put their hands on the table where different objects appear following the logic of the film. The hero caresses a muff on a screen and the muff appears on the table and so on. These would be absolutely surrealistic and heart-piercing effects. The character touches a corpse, and the hands on the table are immersed in some sort of powder. And we could use six or seven well-selected synchronizations. We should think about it, at least for the future, if we can't put it into practice right now. I think the audience will tremble. Now, the example's instructive, even if, and maybe because, it doesn't represent the main road of tactile cinema. Rather than the complex evocation of touch through the visual or oral that Barker calls the tactile eye, Dali's invention literally aligns touch with the screen. But through this physical conjunction, Dali reveals the radical technical division of the senses that conventional cinema relies on. This artificial synchronization of the senses recalls the experiments in synesthesia that uh, marked the symbolist theater of the fond de siècle, in which directors like Luné Po interwove color, music, words, light, and even distributed perfume-soaked swabs to the audience, or Aldous Huxley's dystopian fantasy of the feelies in which viewers receive tactile sensations electronically synced with scenes appearing on the screen, or even the brief commercial exploitation of smell vision in which appropriate smells were piped into the theater during certain scenes, pine scenes for a forest location, perfume during love scenes. This, I think, was only in a couple theaters, including one in Chicago, which was recently turned de- torn down. I, tried to organize an uh, archaeological uh, foray to see if we could find this machine someplace and, uh, and restore it, but <coughs> nobody responded. Uh, it's significant that none of these techniques became mainstream practices in the cinema. One could claim that in contrast to the spontaneous evocation of touch or smell that an audiovisual film can summon, these devices seem rather to make one aware of the separation of the senses by mechanically bringing them together. Now, I confess, I would love to see, or should I say feel, Dolly's expanded <coughs> cinema, just as I wish I could smell scent of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm fairly sure of their failure in relation to a cinematic project of diegetic realism that they seem to aspire to, making me think I was there. But I'm actually curious about their role as attractions, as technical means of playing with, rather than deluding or convincing our senses. My point here is that in the technology of media, diegetic and narrative absorption is, not, is only one possibility. Certainly, the realm of the senses can be focused on such a task. And this has been the royal, royal, royal road of cinema, or at least of commercial feature-length films. But evoking the tactile may not only serve this realistic end. Not only can it make us aware of our own central delight or horror, but it can also display the role media play in allowing us to combine and invert our central involvements in the world, including rendering them virtual, falls that don't kill us. but deliver the sensation of a vertiginous plunge. Eyes, eyeballs that split without injury. We experience not only our embodiment through the sensual textures of the cinema, but also the virtual nature of the medium, its ability to abstract as well as to involve us, 
and even to do both of these things simultaneously. Next section is on grasp. We come now to the cinema of grasp. Clearly, grasping connects to tactile cinema, but it also holds other associations. The hand is a complex instrument, a multiple medium in itself. We could think of tactility as dealing primarily with the surface. <coughs> think, in fact, of Andy Warhol's description of his art as superficial, intentionally, claiming he stayed on the surface of things like a blind man feeling his way. As opposed to skimming over a surface, the grasp gropes, seizes, and grabs. More than the sensitive fingertips, the flexing fingers and opposable thumb of the prehensile hand operate here. This may seem more alien to cinema, whose apparatus employs surfaces, the screen and even the film strip itself. The grasp evokes that odd in-between zone of space, the haptic, which has been discussed by Marx and Barker, and earlier by Antonia Lant and Noel Birch, but which I feel needs to be differentiated from the tactile, which Marx and Barker don't do. The haptic addresses the hand and the grasp more than the fingertips. In fact, German art historian Alloy Riegel introduced the term in the early 20th century to distinguish the space of Egyptian painting with its sense of solid objects from the optical space of later perspectival systems in which an empty or hollow sense of depth defines space. This led to a confusion that Noel Birch sowed in film studies some decades ago through his use of the term haptic, a confusion that Lant politely and subtly corrected by reading Regal more carefully and taking the relation to Egyptian art more seriously. Birch claimed the haptic in cinema as a component of the ideological project of bourgeois realism that he felt determined the development of film. However, as Lant showed, Regal's use of haptic for Egyptian visual portrayal was actually opposed to that of deep realist space. But Birch's mistake was not simply naive. The sense of being able to grasp objects, the stereometric solidity of things, does play a role in our sense of visual realism in cinema, even if I would claim it's a somewhat ambiguous one. The haptic deals with the construction of space, not simply the sensation of touch, and especially the interaction between the construction of space and of objects. As the space of the grasp, it portrays a more shallow range of space, limited things within one's reach than the visual scope of perspective. As the realm belonging to the hand that reaches and grasps, the haptic carries a sense of the concrete. It contrasts with the diminished tactile experience of the space that visual distance allows, the dematerialization of the blue horizon or the blurring of aerial perspective that address the eye more than the hand. In traditional cinema, modes of focus and lighting make objects seem salient and graspable. Think of the teacups in the Hitchcock's Notorious or the looming poison bottle in Susan Cain, or best, and I couldn't find an image of this, it's interesting, <clears throat> but I hope you all know it, the dark horizontal bar which opens Hitchcock's vertigo against a soft focused background and which is then grasped in close-up by hand as the camera moves back, revealing a climbing figure silhouetted by the twilight blue distance of the cityscape of San Francisco. The hyper-clarity that some digital forms achieve could also relate to the haptic. But I believe the haptic and its evocation of the grasp might be most relevant to 3D cinema, especially its current versions, which technically, as Thomas Elsasser has shown us, is closely dependent on the introduction of digital projection. 
Again, stylistic elements play a role here, and 3D can create a range of effects. But, to even, but even the 19th century stereographs tend to reveal 3D is frequently more about objects emerging from the screen towards us than about recessive space. While rows of bespectacled spectators supplied an image for the disembodied passive dupes of the society of the spectacle, an idea in that preceded but prepared a way for apparatus theory, it seems to me that the true image of the 3D viewer relates much more to the gap between the coordination of hand and eye. The naive 3D spectator <laughs> and the essence of 3D may be that it turns us all back into naive viewers, reaches towards the screen, or perhaps more appropriately, gropes towards the screen. What indeed is a naive viewer in this context is not a viewer who believes in the reality of the image before her, but rather a viewer who does not repress her bodily impulse towards the automatic gesture of verification. The hand that reaches out to touch the objects emerging from a 3D film does not assert a passive assent to the illusion, but rather a skeptical physical testing. The outstretched hand of the 3D viewer meets nothing, or occasionally somebody's hair. <laughs> it grasps at emptiness. It gropes, in effect, towards the intangible medium. This returns me to one of my themes, the technological transformation of the senses. Haptic cinema, cinema of the grasp, like tactile cinema of the touch, does not allow us contact in a literal sense. Rather, it evokes a virtual feeling, and perhaps a feeling of virtuality. It plays with our sensations. It is not simply, simply a simulacrum of touch, although it may be that too. It initiates a game of hide and seek with our senses, shows us how a technology can make, make us experience them in a suspended mode that I relate to the essence of aesthetics. Thus, as perception opens us to a world, aesthetics, and recall that aesthesis means sensation, the aesthetics of touch achieved through cinema open us to a virtual world. Again, we cannot actually grasp what seems within our reach and that constitutes one of the fascinations of the cinema, one I think that 3D intensifies. Far from delivering a tangible illusion, 3D cinema puts us in touch with an abyss of emptiness. The joy or fright occasioned by the virtual emergence of objects or figures meets our actual invulnerability in a phantom embrace, evoking both an experience of triumph, we're not hurt by that leaping lion, and a sense of loss. But there is nothing there. The cinema grasp, in this case, holds on to nothing. Recall the imaginary collision of Cecil Hepworth's early demonstration of cinema, how it feels to be run over, which is on YouTube. If you uh, haven't seen it, please do. It's less than a minute long. From 1900, the motor car that hurdles towards the viewer demonstrates cinema's ability to, to evoke sensation, how it feels, without fatality. The possibility of collision with death or injury vanishes at the screen's border. Our hand can brush across the screen, feeling with its fingertips the surface of the illusion, as the blind woman does in Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. I couldn't quite get that exact <coughs> image, but this is uh, the Peeping Tom himself standing in front of the image, the projected image of the murders that he's enacted. But the possibility of, an actual, of actually grasping the haptic space of the screen can never be fulfilled as deep as that fantasy of doing so may be. Fantasies of penetrating the screen from Keaton Sherlock Jr. on demand a basic transformation of the character's body, a sort of cinematic suspension of the actual physics of space and time. The world of the screen remains unseasonable, unseasonable beyond our grasp. 
the image of the hand reaching towards the film, whether in Tarkovsky's The Mirror or Berg's, uh, Bergman's uh, Persona, serves Barker as a fitting emblem for the tactile eye, alive to texture. But the best emblem for the paradox of haptic cinema, to my mind, comes from Hitchcock. The feebly groping hand of Marion Crane in Psycho as she reaches for something to grab onto at the point of death. Her hand blurs as it comes too close to the camera and reaches towards us and then grasps onto the curtain which it pulls from its rings as she collapses. Characters in films dwell within a realm in which holding on is at least a possibility, but grasping onto them remains impossible for us. The viewers, the structuring taboo, taboo of haptic cinema. As Maxim Gorky said, describing the Lumiere's arrival of the train at the station in 1896, a train, he's quoting Gorky's review, a train appears on the screen, it speeds straight at you, watch out. It seems as though it will plunge into the darkness in which you sit, turning you into a ripped sack of lacerated flesh and splintered bones and crushing into dust and into broken fragments this hall and this building so full of women, wine, music, advice. But this too is but a train of shadows. My last section, gesture, the point of cinema. Well, what of my last? category of the cinema of the hand, the cinema of gesture. I don't intend to dwell here on the role that gesture perform, gestures performed by actors play in the history of cinema, although I hope it implies the context for my discussion. After all, one could claim that hand gestures supplied the first language of the cinema, as it made for children, most literally in the pantomime of actors that conveyed the first stirrings of narrative cinema but also the gestures of everyday life and performance in the pre-narrative films of Edison and Lumiere. But in this sketch, I want to focus on an arguably more primal gesture, the gesture of the camera, which returns me to my other theoretical finger turn, the index, and serves, I hope, to complicate its meaning. Now, the concept of the indexical in relation to film and photography has often been reduced in film studies to a purported bond that the chemically created photographic image has to its referent, the thing that it filmed. Founded in Charles Sanders Peirce's semiotics, this claim has been confused, become confused, with Bazin's claim for the ontology of the photographic image in a manner that does make some sense, but also distorts, I believe, both these claims which were never aware of each other. I've discussed Bazin's ontological claims for <coughs> cinema elsewhere, and I don't think it's important to bring up here. But it must be recalled that Peirce's term for a category, or rather an aspect of the sign, is very much rooted in the association of the index with the hand through the gesture of pointing. Rather than in the aspect of iconic resemblance, or symbolic conventional codes that Peirce names as the other aspects in his theory of signs. And recall that for Peirce, signs work by participating in all three aspects. The index points to its reference. The trace, so often cited as the example of the influence of the index, the footprint, the bullet hole, offers one such way of pointing. But so does the diagram, the turning weather vane, or the symptoms of an illness, such as fever. The photograph, as a light impression, is, according to Peirce, one form of an index. But I think the gestural sense of pointing also has further relevance for photography, and even more for cinema. <clears throat> Most film theorists invoking the index indicate the primal gesture of cinema and photography lies in the passive act of capturing a focused image of light on a sensitive photographic surface. But we might enlarge our understanding of photography by highlighting the active gesture of pointing the camera. Especially with cinema, 
in which mobility plays a key role. The act of pointing defines the process of shooting as much as the registration of the image does. I don't want to restrict this to the act of choosing where to point, since films can abdicate the role of conscious intention, but rather to the act of framing by whatever agent, whether it's human, mechanical, or pure chance, performs it, and thereby directing the audience's attention. The gesture of pointing cuts a trajectory through space and aims us towards something. We tend to think of photographs or cinematic shots as pictures, even if in the latter case they are moving. Certainly this isolates an important act they play, relating them to the tradition of the framed composition, the tableau, which focuses the images within a composed space. But without denying the richness of this tradition and the clear ways in which cinema and photography has used uh, pictures as a model, I want to explore a different conception, one referring as much to the hand as to the eye. Pointing and shooting announces a different attitude than depiction, one that directs attention rather than constructing an image. It would be foolish to try to separate these aspects entirely. In cinema and photography, one supports the other. We point the camera with an eye to composition. But to think of cinema's indexical function as gestural, as a dynamic relation within the world, may allow us to attend to a different aspect of the cinema than the pictorial, one bound more to the hand and to vectors in space than to the eye and the frame. The gesture of pointing fundamentally displaces us. Pointing away from itself, it not only announces look, but look over there. It directs us in space. Thus in cinema, the gesture of pointing facilitates the interaction of spaces, as in this key image in Hitchcock's blackmail. In being directed, our gaze is not only centered, it is moved. It switches our orientation. It traverses space. In contrast to the touch or the grasp, which aspire towards direct contact, the gesture of pointing expresses distance and generally separation. As such, its relation to the hand may seem most metaphorical and, well, rather distant. It instructs us to look away from the hand itself towards something else. However, I believe it also solidifies our sense of the paradoxical relation cinema and technology generally has to the hand. As a gesture, it embeds the body in an act of communication. It opens us towards meaning. Pointing could be contrasted, perhaps, with the caress, which is closer to the grasp and the touch, an aspect of proxemics, nearness. The caress bespeaks intimacy. Pointing casts our senses into broader space, beyond our reach. Instead of closing about an object, our index finger extends outward, indicating a direction for a glance. Pointing in this sense develops the central phenomenological concept of intentionality, consciousness as directed outwards towards something, and not necessarily, as it's sometimes mistakenly claimed, expressing a purpose. Heidegger defines consciousness as always outside of itself, projected into the world. We should therefore characterize our embodied being as always exceeding itself, however anchored in our body, our Dasein may be. Now I've traced two somewhat different orientations in the relation that cinema bears to the hand. On the one hand, cinema retains a relation to the physical hand. Its images evoke the central experiences of touch and of the grasp, as well as the gesture of pointing. However, none of these evocations carried by cinema remain limited to the physical hand. As much as cinema is a virtual process of seeing, it also functions as a virtual hand. The cinematic hand exceeds the fleshly hand. If the hand supplies a model for our orientation to the world that cinema activates and extends, it remains a technological hand. 
technology, as Bernard Siegert and Gilbert Somondon have shown us, is not simply a prosthetic substitute for the body, but an extension of the possibilities of the body's interaction with the world. It is too simple to see technology as a contradiction of the fleshly, to oppose embodied being, being to the transformation of the bodily that technology allows. Technology is rooted in our bodily being and our orientation to the world. It extends and transforms the world and redefines our imbrication within it. This doesn't mean that it doesn't carry dangers, just as our physical body implies the possibility of both vulnerability and violence. But I believe the worst violence technology enables may be bound up in forgetting its role as an extension of the body. But I also deny that technology necessarily removes us from our embodied being. Digital cinema, as one of the furthest technological developments of motion pictures, points both back to and beyond the human hand. Thank you. there are some questions and comments and arguments. So um, just raise your hand. <laughs> Don't point. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for that. That's fascinating. And I, I want to ask you about the sort of shift in the end from the consumption of images by viewers to the production of images by photographers and your, your image of the banks of shooters. It seems that substantially and significantly different, uh, the, the, the point, shall we say, changed there uh, toward the end of the talk. And I'm wondering if you can maybe do a little more to reconnect back to what the pointing means when we go around to the, to the, the other end of the camera, right? Or, or to say, the into the theater, shall um, we say. Yeah. Uh, how does it work then when we're thinking about the point of cinema from, say, the seat in the theater rather than from the person doing yeah. Well, I, I guess um, it's very essential, I mean, thank you for the question, for the opportunity of clarification, that when the camera is pointed, it's not pointed for the filmmaker or photographer, it's pointed for the viewer. I mean, I mean they are doing it, but they're doing it <coughs> with us in mind. So, uh, so for me, that gesture is already uh, involved. In, uh, in, in the person in the theater, the person who's looking at the photograph. Um, so it's, it's, it's totally continuous. Uh, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about how there's, there's a difference there in that we actually see, see the gesture of pointing. But my point is that for, for watching a film, I think involves constantly being pointed in a certain direction. This is partly what I'm saying. There are moments in films where this becomes very explicit, uh, which would be my prime examples. In a certain way, though, I would say it underlies everything. I see the uh, continuity there, but I also see a difference between pointing and, as you just put it, being pointed. Right? Isn't pointing and being pointed, even if right they're on the opposite ends of the same circuit, isn't there something quite different about those two stations? I, the I, 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 I think I understand your question, but I don't think I would agree. I mean, yes, there's a difference, but they're, they're totally uh, founded upon each other. In other words, if, if, if all we ever saw were you know, cameramen pointing mm -hmm. a camera, uh, then you know, we would not be involved in that gesture up there and say, oh, look, they're pointing their cameras. Rather, the point is, exactly the point is, uh, that, uh, that we will see that the image will involve that act of pointing. So in other words, we're, we're uh, uh, you know, totally involved in it. Our act, and, and partly what I'm trying to do is to try to say the act of looking at an image is not simply an act of seeing, it's an act of being directed. Uh, and uh, that, that act of being directed is kind of virtual point. So yeah, so the, the difference, of course, I mean, um, if I understand your point, is that the actual gesture is there in the production. But I would say the effect of the gesture, uh, the, the, you know, is, is there in the reception of it. Uh, so yeah, so we are pointed. Uh, and and the, the point would be exactly that we are pointed, you know, that we're, we're in continuity with that, that, uh, that gesture. So the gesture is, I mean, this is, I think one of the key points that you're raising here is that 
whereas the others are kind of directly physiological. As I said, this involves more, um, uh, you know, an open uh, kind of signification. Uh, so that what we're being, what's happening when we are pointed in a direction is we're communicating with. Mm -hmm. And my point is that, I'm sorry, don't be, <laughs> it's impossible to stop it. But is, is precisely that, again, the difference between the picture and the gesture. You know, in other words, that what a film is doing is gesturing us, that it involves a gesture uh, that makes us look. One way to maybe think about this is, is a, a parallel with this idea of the gesture that's been used very often in talking about action painting, particularly Jackson Pollock, that what one wants, uh, wants feels when one looks at the Pollock painting is not just, oh, there's a bit of paint that goes like this, but rather the gesture of the hand that made it. And what I'm claiming is that that's actually embodied in the technology of cinema. The cinema, from the very beginning, has not just a sense of, here's a picture, and, well, it's moving, you know, but rather this, this sense of, look at this, that there actually is this. One might claim there's something like that in painting, too, but I think it's more pronounced uh, in, in cinema because partly we have the sense of the, uh, the apparatus having been pointed. Uh, but I, I, I understand your point, but I actually would, and that difference, is something that's important to me. We actually, in the third element here, move from contact to signification. But to me, it's still very much related to this to this idea of an involvement with, with the hand and uh, and with our sense of the gesture. The, we always think of gestures as, as embodied. And if we begin to think of cinema as gestural, I think it, it actually brings us to an understanding of things that, that are somewhat obscure otherwise. No. Yeah. Um, yes, Patrice. Um, thanks very much for your talk. I, I, I hate to belabor the, the third movement, um, but I love the slide where you had, you know, pointing, but in your text you talked about the point of cinema. Yeah. Which I wondered if you'd just say a little bit more about how this work fits in with larger discussions right now. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, Dudley Andrews, you know, rethinking Bazan and, you know, what not, you know, what is cinema, but what cinema is. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, you're trying to elaborate on that from the context of the digital. But mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, what do you do, in, in terms of your argument, how does it link up with these larger arguments that we're having right now in our field? Mm -hmm. But secondly, why would this only be specific to cinema, not to television or other kinds of representational media? Games. Uh, Game. well, okay, games. Uh, I but I thought you games. gestured towards gaming a bit. Yeah. But uh, I mean, first off, just to answer the last part, I wouldn't say all representational media, but all moving images. Yes, okay. I do intend this to be okay, good. Uh, relevant. I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with cinema because, uh, but exactly, kind of idea of digital cinema, I don't know that there's any difference between that and, and, and video. Uh, its relation to games, I think, is a little more complex, but maybe even a little more directly uh, worked out. I, it's not, I, I'm not, a, you know, I hardly ever played a game, and I mainly know about games with theoretical, you know, uh, uh, conceptions that I hear about in, uh, uh, you know, conferences, so I don't want to claim. But my sense is, first off, yes, this is relevant to every movie image. Um, and yeah, I think every movie image. I mean, so, you the, know, you know, so the, when you say at the end, which I, I loved it, but, you know, kind of superseding the ontological discussion about what cinema is, yeah. you're, you're trying to talk about the point of cinema, which yeah. seems to be a, a larger point about uh, technology and the body. Yeah. No, so it, I just I mean, was to, wondering if you would yeah, to, riff to on to that. To answer the more first part, kind of, you know, to, to point directly at Dudley. Uh, yeah, I totally dis I mean, I, I love Dudley and I love that book, but I totally disagree with it, and in many ways this is a polemic against it, because for Dudley, what cinema isn't is digital cinema. Right. And, uh, and for him, it has to have this kind of realist claim, and I'm kind of saying it never quite has that realist claim, uh, that rather it has a, a, a very different kind of involvement with the world. In some way, there's something that we share, in our sense of, uh, you know, and, and that I share with Pazan, in our sense of, of uh, cinema's invocation in the world. But my point is exactly, that's not gonna go away simply because we're not making, you know, new wave films anymore. 
you know, that is, I think, inherent in all these things which are technological, but not limited simply to the way that the image is made. And so, um, so yeah, I, and, and actually, if I encourage you right, you, you did a very clever thing that I wish I had thought of. Uh, the contrast between what the point of cinema rather than what cinema is. Right. You know, cinema, and I, I even said to Dylan, like, wow, even the family said, what is cinema? You're telling me what it is? Exactly. You know, yeah, uh, we do you want to say, you know, cinema is what? You know the answer. Uh, and to me, it is a question. It is open, and that's one of the reasons that I talk about the open gesture of, of, of the pointing. And exactly, the point indicates to me it is a trajectory that it's always moving. And uh, you know, that uh, therefore freezing cinema, because I think what Dudley's book is about what cinema was exactly. for him. And uh, and mine is about what cinema might be and is and has been. You know, in other words, a, a, a continuity that within enormous differences is always about kind of pointing forwards. So you're you're absolutely right. You said it, man. It was right there. You <laughs> said it enough, uh, and, and that is what what I intended. The other thing I might just mention is, of course, the idea of it's an action rather than a state of being. I might add that you know I actually think of myself very often as a Zanny, and in the one essay really written on the Zan, I uh, talk about his essay, um, you know, the uh, myth of total cinema. And the main thing that Bazan says there, and it's, people just go past it, you know, say, oh, Bazan just has this idealist idea of cinema. It says, cinema has not yet been invented. That's, to some extent, what I think, you know, it's, it's not what this paper is saying, but it's what this paper is kind of trying to demonstrate. That it is continually being invented, and that that's the nature of cinema. What cinema is, is its capacity for <coughs> Just kind of an extension of that, or it would be, well, I'm thinking when you're saying Bazan says cinema has not yet been invented, when you think about the myth of a total cinema, he's talking about the virtual in a way, he's sort of pointing or gesturing towards the virtual, so it is interesting, I think, um, but yeah, that's just, a, but I actually, having heard your talk at, at lunch, which was wonderful, also the um, on comics and the graphic novel. At one point, you said something. You said the image, um, the Im image aspires to language, and I think I got it right. And language aspires to the image. And I would, was wondering if you would say the same thing that the image aspires to gesture and. It's a little bit wonky, <laughs> but uh, in uh, translating it directly, but uh, the gesture also aspires to the image. It, 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 in the sense I, that the I wouldn't quite do the same thing because I don't think gesture and, yeah. and image are the same thing as yeah. image and language. Mm -hmm. Rather, what it would say is that in cinema, the image um, becomes particularly embodied. I'm not trying to claim it yeah. isn't at all embodied in in mm -hmm. uh, uh, painting or obviously. <coughs> Photography. But what I am really saying, what the point, you know, and it's part of why the idea of this gestural um, uh, action, you know, is, is important to me, is precisely that it, it occupies that space uh, of, of an embodied um, uh, uh, presence. And yet at the same time, and this I hope is clear, saying it never can occupy it because it's not a body. So, you know, it is a virtual body, and and uh, and the world that it grows towards is the virtual world. So what we have is at the same time an, an enormous address towards our body. Climb right in here and take <coughs> this for a ride. And at the same time, when the film's over, you can still be in your movie seat. I got Richard. Yeah, Tom, uh, I can't help but ask two questions. It's a disease. Um, so the first, uh, and really the main question is, I really like what you're doing here with the digital and, and emphasizing on digital media how, in fact, it's not embodied at all. And of course, if you think about it, I mean, we can't, without our hands, we yeah. don't boot up the computer, yeah. we don't exactly. type, we don't move the yeah. cursor, things like that. And so uh, 
in a way, digital cinema is even more, or digital media, one could say, yeah. is, is even more dependent upon the hand yeah. and more physical, and games yeah. even more so because your games and and uh, you know moving uh, your avatar, yeah, your character right. in the screen uh, is, and then you know you're involved in this kind of constant feedback loop between you know your body, uh, your hand, the screen, your right. eyes, and and so forth. Now, of course, as you mentioned as well, um, it's when you draw the line somewhere technologically, the technology changes and we might get to a point where we don't need our hands to activate digital media, Google Glass, for example, or games like Wii or you gesture and, and so on. But at least at this point, what seems to connect digital media to uh, audiovisual media is in fact the hand yeah. and it makes you wonder in a certain sense about to think at least a little bit about the experience of going to the theater uh, and seeing a film and what role the hand has in initiating that yeah. transaction. Yeah. Um, you have to reach into your pocket or wallet with your hand to pay to then, you're then handed a ticket which you then hand to somebody who tears it and gives, you, gives it back to you. And so there's this sense in which just as the hand initiates our engagement with digital media, the hand actually does play in the act, you know, in the sort of embodied act of mm -hmm. going to see a, a film in a theater or seeing it in any medium, really, plays an act of initiating that, that action. I think that that's kind of um, interesting as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question, which is very fast, is, and the first one maybe wasn't a question, second question very fast I'm was... Um, anyway. yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite uh, schlock horror films is Oliver Stone's The Hand, um, which is one of his first, if maybe his first film. Do you know this? No, I don't. Oh my God, so you I need to see that. So, so The Hand that. is about a comic book artist whose hand is amputated and then goes and, so this unites your, this afternoon's uh, talk, and then the hand goes out on its own and acts and commits all sorts of crimes and things like that. And definitely a film you need to see, I think, in relation to this because if you ever want to think about an allegory of yeah. you know, hand and film. Um, there's also, I always link with that George Romero's uh, Monkey Shines, uh, which is a similar idea of this uh, monkey who works as a kind of um, extension of a yeah. quadriplegic or a paraplegic yes. and uh, then ends up turning against its man. Right, yeah. Anyway. Well, a couple things. I want to, uh, precisely, I, I absolutely agree with you. It is why, you know, yes, by no means was I, you know, I was talking about digital cinema, but I hoped that the connection to other media would be there. Uh, as I say, my sense is with games, this is very, very important. I don't, since I believe in experience and I don't play them, <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to speak about them, you know, uh, other than to say, yeah, sounds, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but also I just want to mention a little bit about the hand. Part of my point, and it's, it's a little bit of a polemic against the way that I think, you know, as much as I'm sympathetic with the way that the embodied uh, spectator from Shabiro to Subcheck to uh, Barker and, and Marcus has been great. I do feel it's, it, it's a little limited. And partly, as I said, you know, the difference between the tactile and haptic, which for them is one word, uh, is something that I want to emphasize. But also the nature of what it means to be physical. And one of the points about the hand is it's the extension of our body. You know, in other words, my point, very much, you know, based in Heidegger, but in phenomenology generally, is we don't, you know, we aren't just this little black box that receives the world, decodes it, and then acts on it. We're implicated in it, as Berlin would say, but we're implicated on it partly because our body is constantly exceeding itself. And the hand seems to me, I'm the very last image, uh, with a little bit of an in-joke, it's an image of uh, a spiritualist image of, uh, of a, a spiritual energy coming out of the hand, which I don't believe in. But <laughs> as a metaphor, I think it's absolutely right. So that we're constantly, you know, the point is, I, I think too often the kind of sense of over-embodied comes back into the lump of flesh, whereas to me, 
And therefore, this one would seem to be contradictory to machines, which aren't lumps of flesh, but rather the flesh of the world that Merleau-Ponty talks about is the way that we're invested and that it, it's a constant loop back and forth between the world and our body, and that our body is always more than our body. And the hand is the perfect emblem of that. It's not the only, I mean, the eye has been, but the eye tends to be, you know, used in that Cartesian sense of, you know, to see the world, uh, whereas the hand makes it very clear. So yes, the hand does all, all kinds of things in the uh, movie theater. Uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. One of the most interesting theaters that I think has ever been conceived and it's by somebody who I'm very much indebted to for all my concepts of cinema. Uh, it was designed by Peter Kabelka in New York City at Anthology Film Archives in the 1970s called The Invisible Theater. Anybody know about this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, it was a theater that was designed in such a way that when you sat in your seat, all you could see was the screen because it was a hood that came down and went to the top of the screen. There were two uh, kind of partitions between each seat that stopped at the edge of the screen and then the top of the next row blocked the bottom. So all you saw was just this you know, square of the, uh, of the screen itself. But Kabelka said, you know, so right, because he really wanted everyone to focus on the visual experience, he said, but at the uh, arms of the chairs, I've left an open space so people can hold hands. <laughs> <laughs> now what was very interesting is, this wasn't just inhabited by couples, and it was in the you know lower uh, part of New York City, and it became a place where I think the only appropriate word is the old-fashioned mashers began to come because they realized they could be totally invisible. You know, and uh, friends of mine would talk about suddenly this hand, and seeing this relatively invisible body. But also in responding to your uh, point, it's of course a whole genre of hand stuff, the, the uh, kind of fur form of it, besides the trick films uh, of, of Melies and Sylvinda the Showman, which often have disembodied hands, uh, is the German expression of uh, the hands more like, you know, which is about someone getting you know, somebody else's hands or maybe getting somebody else's hands, uh, which was also remade into a uh, horror film in uh, the 30s, uh, Mad Love. And yeah, and then um, uh, Robert Flores, the Beast with Five Fingers, the one that, that Oliver Stone was ripping off right now. Yeah. But I didn't know it was a cartoon artist. That does make it a little more interesting. But yeah, but I think that whole sense of, do I know what my hands are doing? Which, of course, is something else that Marx invokes right. with the idea that uh, under capitalism in industrial production, the worker becomes just a hand. So it's also the fear of losing the hand's connection to the whole. Um, you know, that it becomes only the tool of the, uh, the protocol of work. Yes? Um, there's an argument that has been made, but I'm interested in knowing your point in your context. It's been said that the tactility of um, the celluloid cinema mm -hmm. is a play on the actual physicality to which you referred, you know, the slicing of the film mm -hmm. as the editing, and then there is a slicing mm -hmm. on the eye. So when you, you know, step from that to the digital, does anything change in your point of view? Well, that is exactly kind of what I'm asking, you know, and, and of course, in a way, first introducing this possibility that, you know, it seems much more directly tactile, you know, uh, with uh, when we're splicing and, and, and things like that. My point, though, is precisely that to, you know, to kind of make it explicit, which, uh, uh, that I don't think you ever get away from the body. You know, in other words, to me, these are extensions of the body. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a difference, you know, just as I'm sure there's a difference between sewing without a sewing machine, sewing with a sewing machine, and not sewing at all, just getting it off the shelf. You know, all of those are different registers, and I'm not trying to say it's all the same. But I am saying none of, what, what interests me is that I think at every stage, the stage just before seems like the perfect one, the one that dis disappeared. So that it was interesting. I realized when I was showing the image of the seamstress at her uh, singer sewing machine, you know, talking about the machines replacing the hand, how much that doesn't replace the hand. You know, how much a seamstress at a sewing machine actually is really using the hand, and the only thing it's doing is taking away the boring thing of going in and out, in and out. So my quick answer is, 
although I don't want to lose any uh, central reference in our descriptions of things, I'm very suspicious of anybody who says we've lost it. I think that's a myth, because I think we've always lost it. You know, uh, in other words, you know, it's it's to me there is no Eden where we were in pure. I mean, except for the womb. You know, but we all have left it, and nobody has the option to stay. Uh, so for me, I guess I would say, yeah, I'm sure there's something lost and there's something gained. You know, and I don't believe that we ever lose our our, our physical uh, connection. You know? But you know, that isn't to say it isn't an anthropological question about the nature of work that could be investigated. But I would theoretically try to say. It, it, you know, this is the nature of technology. It would keep on extending things. Yeah. And that I don't think that's bad. So, yes. Um, so, I've been kind of interested in like this, um, this movement in some research um, uh, in digital media, um, specifically thinking about things like smartphones and mm -hmm. laptops and tablets mm -hmm. and seeing these as extensions of our own bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, but that they become not so much just extensions of our own bodies, right? Like this becomes more than just an extension of my hand, but also becomes an extension of my identity. Um, because I can use it to let other people know my thoughts and my feelings and what I believe and, right? So like, so this is very much, I mean, I kind of caught up in the internet too, right? Like the web. Um, but um, this movement in, in the research then says that like, because of things like this, then we can't think of ourselves as just human anymore. We have to think of ourselves as almost cyborgs, right? That like, now we kind of become one with our technology. And I'm wondering like, how a movement like that, like how that argument kind of fits into, what fits into or maybe doesn't fit into kind of what you're talking about here with cinema. Yeah. I guess the main thing that I would say I'm a little suspicious with the argument, even though I think it's got resonance, you know, but on a mythological risk, is the idea as though, as though, I, you know, one could say all of what she said is true of language. You know, I mean, in other words, my point is, this is the nature of human beings to me, is that you're always going out of yourself and communicating. And, and the medium itself, I think, is historically, the differences are interesting. They may be interesting aesthetically. They may be interesting uh, anthropologically. But the fear I always have is that people are going to think this is a new thing. That in some way, we used to have some essence that was you know, demonstrable. And that now, suddenly, we're in the inauthentic realm of, uh, of cell phones. You know. you know, I'm not saying that you can't be inauthentic on a cell phone, <laughs> you know, but I've been inauthentic talking with people, you know, that were two feet away from me. I mean, I mean in other words, lying, you know, I, I, I'm very suspicious of the idea that authenticity is attenuated by, uh, by technology. Now, that isn't to say that I'm saying it isn't a question to talk about, you know, and to think about. But all too often, I don't find it something that is a research, not, not research, but I mean, a, 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 something to be explored as much as a conclusion already involved. That because we have this inauthentic, you know, extension of ourselves, or this extension is inauthentic. And my point would be, there's no purely authentic, and, and in fact, it's authentic that has the possibility of lying. That's, that's the nature of things, you know. So touch, voice, kisses, all those things can be just as deceptive as um, uh, um, you know, Facebook. That being said, I did wonder whether my last <coughs> health affair was ruined because it was on Facebook. You know? <laughs> yeah. But but I wasn't sure. I mean I also knew that was just much too easy <laughs> uh, as a way to explain. I guess. Um, I really like your point about uh, about not uh, overly emphasizing the change in terms of bodily change, uh, the effects on the body. But there is something about the old choreography and ensemble that is lost, and this is why we are running on treadmills, because mm -hmm. we, it had, the body has to be engaged separately, because it couldn't be engaged to older forms of work. Mm -hmm. Same with the sedentarization of the body, yeah. which is very common among children, and all sorts of diseases that are emerging. So it's nothing to do with cinema. 
But yeah. there is some serious transformation that has happened. I, first of all, I would say I would agree with you, although then I'm going to modify it a little bit. I mean, I believe that history happens, so things do change. I have to admit also, I'm somewhat like Nietzsche and think, and what it's always doing is getting worse. Uh, so I don't want to, to, to indicate, you know, a passable optimism here. However, I guess what I'm saying is, to investigate this, we've got to get much more fine grained and think about power relations, think about you know uh, a variety of things. I mean, clearly, I, um, I mean, my son works on uh, Middle Eastern media. And you know his initial uh, MA thesis was about the Trier Square. And there is a way that a lot of people saw that as you know, you know new social media allowing social transformation. It then, you know, nobody knows what to make of the fact that it didn't work in some way. You know, did that mean, you know, that it was inauthentic? And my point would be that I think we've got to be very careful and not assign causal relations in a very broad sense. So, uh, yes, I would absolutely agree. Although at the same time, it's, it's always to be very complicated. And I do, and this is, again, <coughs> somewhat my non-Nietzschean, if not optimism, resignation, that I do kind of feel that we do lose things and gain things. And, uh, and I wouldn't deny, you know, as someone with a great deal of nostalgia for nitrate film, you know, that there's a beauty to a nitrate print, which none of you have probably seen, or very few of you, uh, uh, that, you know, that we won't see anymore, you know. At the same time, I kind of got, yeah, so, you know, I also won't see my, you know, coloring book for page six, and, you know, <laughs> get over it. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm worried about nostalgia at the same time that I don't want to deny it. I am worried about uh, the sense that, that, uh, that most of technology is in the hands of power. And I guess what I'm partly saying is let's go back and analyze the power rather than assign it to the technology. But yeah, and on the very fine line of what you're talking about, this kind of bodily choreography of how, you know, yeah, what, there's an extraordinary film by uh, Harun Faroki, uh, what's it called, the Contrast, is it, or Comparison? Yeah, like about comparison. brick making. In uh, and it goes through brick making, which they're all filmed at the same time. But uh, mud bricks in, in Africa, kiln-made uh, uh, bricks in, in, uh, in India, and factory-made bricks. And there's no question that you feel a loss when you're seeing the machine do it. But at the same time, you kind of go, yeah, so what? You know, I mean, I mean not so what, but you know, life is, is, is about losing things. And I think that's actually one of the things I think is, is, is important to keep in mind, that I feel that there's very often a kind of nostalgia that doesn't say, you doesn't have a plan of how not to lose things, it's just about <coughs> mourning things. And I believe with Freud, mourning is important, and that's how you get over things. So. Yes, in fact. Um, I have been thinking about body genres and the ways mm -hmm. that um, you know we experience, we have an embodied experience of lots of different kinds, whether it's pornography, you know, yeah. or whatever. And um, I'm wondering if and how and why the hand yeah. is different, or is it different from these other kinds of embodied experiences mm -hmm. of moving images? It's a good question. And my sense is it is, I mean, just partly, like, it's a different topic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to some extent, when particularly Linda Williams worked out this idea of the body genres, meaning particularly the horror film, the porno film, and to some extent the melodrama. And what was striking about all of them was that they were all about kind of physical reactions. You know, uh, the porno film uh, inspires, you know, masturbation. Uh, the uh, the uh, melodrama makes you cry, and the horror film makes you scream. Or, I mean, my favorite, you know, the uh, supposed, I guess it's actually verified uh, variety thing of, you know, after some film, uh, there was no dry seat in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I think Linda was particularly interested in there was this immediate kind of uh, physiological. Uh, reaction to these kind of genres, and and particularly to the way that that had made the genres lower on a cultural hierarchy. 
And I think that's a profound you know, uh, insight. However, the difference about the hand, I think, is that it's less, and it is, it, it is a slightly different, not that I want to deny that, but it is, it's more active. It, it, I mean, in other words, to some extent, although Linda's model of the physiological spectator is, is I think, true and interesting, it's very passive. You know, it's very kind of responding to a stimulus. Whereas what I'm interested in the idea of the hand is the way that we are drawn into a relation to what's on the screen. Now, let me be really clear. You find hands in all the genres. You know, but, but I'm kind of saying that what I think Linda was talking about is the body of the genre was, is a little different from what I'm trying to invoke with the hand, which is to some extent more uh, actively um, uh, involved. I mean, I don't want to set up a hierarchy, and as I say, that asks, you know, but in other words, I would be interested in looking at what are the images of hands, and then also, you know, what are the protocols of the hand of the audience, you know, uh, if some of them are kind of obvious, but, um, uh, you know. So, there is something a little different from the physiological uh, response to the more active <coughs> idea, and even if it's not that you literally suspect her or handling something, but that watching the hand or, or, or the, the kind of gestural elements uh, of the film. So, what I'm now thinking though is that you know, the textural aspects of, 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 a, of an erotic film, uh, the tactile, are absolutely what I was talking about in the first part, so I'm not sure that that distinction is that strong, but that's where I would draw the distinction. Hi, I, I, I you know, thank you for your talk. It's really lovely, and I think it really extends a lot of your work. Um, and I see a lot of connections both with your talk earlier and thinking about focusing on process and perception rather mm -hmm. than essence. And mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that in your work more generally. But I was wondering about um, maybe, and this is an extension of your discussion of body genres, um, but obliquely, because what the, the hand calls up and you've invoked Marx is also labor. And I was wondering how this theorization of the hand might be a way of accounting for presenting a theory of style. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, not just yeah. uh, kind of authorial style or intentionality, yeah. but thinking about the force fields of style mm -hmm. um, and uh, the ways in which the cinema carves out space and time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking also about Leslie Stern, who writes about the, the gesture of the cinematographic mm -hmm. uh, of cinematographic movement yeah. um, and camera movement. So that it kind of opened it up in this way, where. Mm -hmm. um, not just in terms of the agency of the person behind that's pointing, but just mm -hmm. in a broader field, thinking yeah. about labor and style. I think yeah. a really interesting yeah. question. I, um, it's absolutely kind of where I feel this needs to go. I mean, not that literally, I'm mm -hmm. going to take this essay to add that. But there are several points where I kind of say this will take us back to stop. And it was actually hoping that someone like you was listening. And, uh, let me just open it up a little bit, because for what I said, it's kind of like a big question for me, uh, but a, a very definite uh, goal. Um, style on the hand is really interesting to me. Now, the most obvious way that we think about it is like in style of drawing or style of writing, you know, literally just in a calligraphy. Uh, and um, the idea of the gesture, I mean, one of the things that interests me in the gesture, in, in thinking of the camera as gestured, is that it does kind of continue with that. Now, on the one hand, you can talk about, you know, handheld camera and, you know, gesture, something like racket you know, which has been talked about a bit, but I think a lot more can be thought through, you know, where you actually have the sense of feeling the hand uh, behind the camera. But the more kind of abstract element that you're talking about, I think is, is, is something that this could open up. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a corridor I haven't gone down, so it might be, you know, locked doors all down the way. But my, my sense is that what you're saying is, is absolutely uh, important. That in other words, thinking about, one of the, the key things is thinking about the film that we watch as not just an exchange of visual information or even visual beauty, but rather as a kind of interaction, you know, as those shaking hands with us. I mean, <laughs> totally metaphorical, but I think you know what I mean. And so the, what you begin to look for is what 
is the labor there, you know, that, that's going on. And, and one of the things that's so fascinating in film, even though I'm actually somebody who in many ways will defend kind of auteurism, uh, is that there is this real mystery about what made that moment. I mean, I just had this very anecdote, but interesting experience watching uh, a film that uh, just recently came on the DVD uh, with Gary Garson called Desire Me from 1945. It was a film that um, caused the firing, supposedly, of Louis D. Mayer because everyone thought it was the worst film that MGM had ever produced. And it's this weird melodrama. And not only did I think it was kind of a good movie, it was very odd. I mean, I see why it's a plot. It's the least playable, <laughs> least classically constructed. You know? and, uh, but it totally seemed, it, it had four directors, Cooper, <laughs> Urban Leroy, oh God, and then two acts, I think. Uh, you know, and yeah, they seemed to be totally stylistically coherent. Now, I don't know it. Maybe partly you don't have one cinematographer. You know? Maybe that's what makes it seem, maybe it's because of the genre. Or maybe it's because you've got to really rethink what style is. Not just by going, it's not group or it's not individual, but really something involved with how are we led into the film, what, what, what are the markers, stuff like that. I mean, one of the reasons that I have trouble with, with uh, Dudley's book is that I think he looks at those films, you know, I mean, he probably would not like Desire Me, but it's a type of film that he would have liked or could like, and, um, and thinks we understand it, whereas I look at it and go, I don't know what's going on here. And then not just in terms of plot and ideology, although there are points where I'm not sure what's going on uh, in, in the love affairs. But, uh, it, but yeah, to me, there is this kind of question. What, how do we have a dialogue in this film? And that, to some extent, the idea of thinking about it as gesture, as labor, as something made, all of this, to me, might open up new questions, new ways to ask questions. Uh, but I have to admit, I have no idea what that might be bullshit. So. <laughs> So uh, before we uh, give Tom a hand, uh, let me invite you to join us upstairs for a little reception uh, on the ninth floor. So thank you.